So, my dear brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, I know it's freezing outside and it, it was uh, it's, uh, from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's allowed us to come and worship Him in jama'ah and then especially stay and listen to a, a talk that we can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> One of the things that uh, many of us experience is when we our first visits to the Kaaba, our first visit to Mecca, our first visit to the Holy Land, as as they would say. And uh, when one goes on that journey and they see the Kaaba for the first time, and they see the land where the Prophet وسلم, and his Sahaba, the companions, the land that they actually walked and spent time, they, it affects them. It affects every single person in a different way. So one of the, when the, the first time I had ever went to the Kaaba, it was obviously, you know, it's an emotional thing. Right? You, you, you're excited to see the Kaaba, you're excited to see, you know, Mecca. You're absorbing everything. You know, you, you have like this uh, anxiety almost. And then finally when you see the Kaaba, you know, it, it, it's overwhelming. And uh, emotionally speaking, you, you get affected by it. So one of the things that we should consider, some, some of the things that we need to think about, because obviously this is you worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So after the emotions settle in, you know, because remember, all you before seeing the Kaaba, before actually visiting this place, everything is abstract. You know, you've studied it in books, you've heard stories about it. If you have youth, if you have your children with you, this is only stories that they've heard. So when you actually see it and you know that this actually existed, it affects you in a different way. So while you, you visit multiple times and you look, you start thinking about the history of the Arab, of the area, right? Of the people, of our, what we say, our pious predecessors, our ancestors. <coughs> and why do you, you know, I, you know, this is something that I need to make clear. Technically, they're not my ancestors, right? Because I'm European, right? But the reality is, this is where Islam comes in. When Islam comes in, into, into, your, into your blood, as per se, because you were born a Muslim, they become your ancestors. Right? The, the Kaaba becomes yours. Mecca and Medina become yours. So, it doesn't belong to any specific tribe. It belongs to the Muslims. It belongs to the believers. So when I say my ancestors, they're my ancestors. So anyone, anyone who tries to rip that away from you, then has no understanding of the fundamentals of Islam. So let us continue. So the people that were there before, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu in one famous hadith, you know, he, he mentions, he says, Inna Allah astafa min waladi Ibrahim Ismail, wa astafa min waladi Ismail Kinana, wa astafa min Kinana Quraysh, wa astafa min Quraysh Banu Hashim, wa astafani min Banu Hashim. So the Prophet Sallallahu He's giving you his lineage, right? He's telling you, listen, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he chose from the children of Ismail, from the children of Ibrahim, Ismail, and from Ismail, Kinana, and from Kinana, Quraysh, 
and from Quraysh, Banu Hashim, and Mustafani and Abu Hashim. Banu Hashim, and I was chosen from Banu Hashim. Right? So the Prophet's lineage goes all the way to the Ibrahim. So when the Prophet <coughs> came with the message of Islam, he came to Quraysh, he came to Mecca with that message. But these are the descendants of Ibrahim. This is something that we tend to forget. We tend to forget that the people that the Prophet was preaching to are descendants of prophethood, are descendants of Ibrahim, are descendants of Ismail. So what happened? Where did, where did it all go wrong? Because you know the story, it's a very famous story, everyone knows it, but just to recap, that the Bekka Valley has always been sacred. Right? And Bekka is just another term for Mecca. Even, it's, it's in the Quran, even the Judeo-Christian traditions, they, they call it as Bekka. So, the Bekka Valley was always there, and everyone knew it. And Ibrahim السلام, was commanded to take his wife and Ismail, his wife Hajar, may Allah be pleased with her, and Ismail السلام, and leave them in the Bekka Valley. And he left them in the Bekka Valley. I'm going to recap shortly, this, uh, so this way we can get into the crux of the matter, right? So, he leaves them there. And when he leaves them there, obviously he leaves and then his wife says, oh, are you going to leave us there? Into, in the middle of nowhere? She doesn't respond until she says, did Allah SWT order you to do so? And then he says, yes. And then she affirms her belief in Allah SWT. Right? Here it is. So the, this is one of the points that you should take away from this. Is that she affirms her belief in Allah SWT and says, if Allah SWT ordered you to do so, then He will not allow us to be destroyed. Right? He will not allow us to go to waste. So then he leaves and he makes dua. And that's the dua that obviously why we go to Mecca, right? Because he makes dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that she would have not only good sustenance and everything, but also companionship, right? And that this would be a place that people would go and visit. So then, that's one extremely important aspect is number one, is that she has complete faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the middle of the desert with provisions, with enough provisions to last her just maybe a few hours, maybe less than a day, and she understands that if Allah SWT ordered her, to do, to, to order her husband to do this, that has to be the correct course. So she runs out of provision. After she runs out of provision, what does she do? Then she starts looking for provision. Right? Although she has tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she is doing her part. So she starts running from Safa and Marwa, looking for something for her and her son. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the angel Jibreel and he clips the ground at the foot of Ismail alayhi salam and Zamzam comes out, the water Zamzam, which exists till today, just so you understand. And this is again another miracle, right? This is, if you want to think about it, between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And Ibrahim alayhi salam is about 2,500 years minimum, minimum. And then between us and the Prophet وسلم, is about 1,500 years. So that's 4,000 years you have a spring still gushing, giving water. That in itself is a miracle. If anyone is looking for the miracles, there you, there's your miracle. The spring scientifically shouldn't exist. 4,000 years giving water. So there it is in itself. And that's why Zamzam is so precious to us. And this is why when we go there, we drink Zamzam and we try to bring Zamzam back home with us. Anyway, she is there. And now, here we come. She's alone. And a tribe, the tribe of Jurhum. And just so you know, this is the Arab tribe. The Arabs originated from where? Where did the Arabs originate from, brothers Ye and sisters? Yemen, you know? Yemen. Yemen, right? Yemen. And... So what about the Arabs of Shab? The Arabs of Syria then? Are they separate or are they not Arabs? Or are they Arabized? No, they're the Arabs. The same tribe, Jurhum. There's Jurhum the first, the Jurhum the second. They, they're the ones who split. They, some stayed in Yemen and some settled. 
in Sham. Sham, we mean the Levant, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, this area, the Levant. Right? So they settled there. Arabs, the same origin, coming from Yemen. So one of them would come to visit their distant cousins. They would leave. And remember what we said. Remember what Allah SWT says about Quraysh. A'udhu billahi min shaytan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Li ila fi Quraysh ila fihim rihlat al-shita'i wa al-sayf. Fali abudu rabba hadha al-bayt. Al-ladhi ata'amahum min juhu amanum min khawf. So Allah SWT is making it clear here that Quraysh, they, they are not only continuing to do what the Arabs normally did, which was what? That they would, in the winter months, they would go to Yemen. And they would trade there. In the summer months, they would go where? They would go to the Levant and trade there. So this is something that the Arabs were doing even before Quraysh existed. They would stay in Yemen and then some months they would go and travel and they would trade up there with their distant cousins and they would come back. So it was a trade route. But here in Bekka Valley, nothing was there. So when this tribe was passing by and they saw that there was some signs of life, there, obviously whenever there's water, then animals come, birds, etc. So they saw that there was something there, they went, and then they approached, and what did they see? They saw something extremely strange. And that is that they saw a woman and a child. For us, we've heard this story so many times that it doesn't seem strange to you. It is quite strange that you would find someone in the middle of the desert, and this is by the way, in today's time, we, we, we really don't think much about the supernatural because we're so ground nowadays in the concrete. Like for instance, if someone mentions shaitan, right? It's like shaitan, shaitan is like, like, can shaitan come in the form of a person? Can the shaitan come in the form of a person? Yes, right? Yes. Has any of you seen the shaitan in the form of a person? No. I mean, I haven't. Maybe some... Shayateen al-Ins, right? But Shaitan himself, no. But at that time, they believed this. And these, this is before Islam. They believed that they were devils, right? And so when they, they saw this woman, they said, well, this, is, this can be something supernatural. Let me be careful. Let us proceed carefully, right? So when they proceed carefully, because obviously there can't be a woman and a child. There's no transportation. There's no camel. There's no horse. There's nothing there. How did she come into the middle of the place and she's there next to water which shouldn't have existed there before? So they proceeded carefully and they asked her, can we have some of your water? Because if they thought anything, this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who instills the fear into them. Because if they believed that they were in a position of power, they could have immediately just killed her or taken her as a slave. Her and Ismail alayhi salam. But they didn't do that. What did they do? They proceeded carefully because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this roar in their hearts <coughs> that, oh, you know, be careful here. And then when they proceeded and they asked, can we have some of your water? What does she say? Is she in a state of fear now? Because her husband left her there. She should have been in a state of fear when her husband left her there. You can consider that abandonment. But he didn't abandon her because she said that she knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordered him to do so. So again, again, her faith and creed with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so strong that she knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not allow her to get destroyed. So in this situation, she does not deviate from this. She continues to believe this strongly in her heart. So what does she say? You can have some of this water if we barter. In other words, you give us provision, you give us some of what you have, and I'll let you have some of this water. And she's in no position to, to negotiate. She doesn't have weapons or power or strength Physically, I mean, that she can overpower them. But they agree. And this is the adab of the Arab as well. Right? This is the adab of the Arab as well. Right? And they agree. And then eventually, these Arabs, right, they marry, they, they marry Ismail alayhi salam because when Ismail grows, he, they, they like him. And they settle there. They know that something must be special about this place. So they settle there. And then the, Ismail alayhi salam marries in, and then from Ismail and this Arab tribe, you have a new group of Arabs, right? These are the Ismaili Arabs, right? Because Ismail alayhi salam is not an Arab, right? So the Ismaili Arabs. So, if Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam are teaching Tawheed, are teaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not only that, we know 
that they also performed Hajj. Right? Before the Prophet ﷺ, they used to perform Hajj. People would come to visit. They would perform Tawaf. So there would be Tawaf around the Kaaba. So this, was, this existed before the Prophet ﷺ came. So they were doing Tawaf. Not only were they doing Tawaf, they were performing Hajj. Other rituals. Right? They were performing these rituals. And we know that the Haram was sacred. The Haram itself. Right? The word Haram comes from Haram. Meaning that it's sacred. Certain things that would normally be halal in this sacred area are haram. So the haram itself, the sanctity of the place, the sanctity of the land, right, is preserved even before the Prophet came. Right? Even before the Prophet. So you see that Ismail and Ibrahim السلام, they had propagated the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then what happens? When did this change? When did this change? So, we know that there was a man by the name of Am ibn Luhay al Khuzari. This man came and became a chieftain of Mecca specifically and leader of Quraysh in general. Although he's not from Quraysh, he's from Zari, right? He becomes the leader of the land. And he himself, again, what did we say about the Arabs, right? When they would trade, they would go to Yemen and they would go where else? Asham, Levant. So, Amr ibn Luhay al Khuzai, when he would go and trade into the, in the Levant, he met a group of people. And they were called Al Amaliq, Amalekites. If you ever gone, if you ever visit Jordan, Amman, Jordan, you will see some of the artifacts of this civilization, the Amalekites. You will see the artifacts there. And history says that these Amalekites, they were tall. They, Amalik, by the way, giants. You, you, if you want to, in Arabic, in technically, they say they call them giants. But giants in what sense? I mean, in, you know, when I was in, in Amman, they, they imagined that these people were real giants, like maybe like 10 feet tall. In reality, no, it's not. Historically speaking, you know, that. They were maybe six, six feet, six and a half feet, seven feet, right, maximum. Because the, the, the general population at that time were like, if you go to Hajj, you see the, the, uh, Yemen, they're shorter. The Arab are shorter individuals, or in general, they're, they're shorter. They're not tall. So when they see six and a half feet tall men and women, then they're impressed. They say, oh, these people are giants. But they weren't only in stature. Because they would, they, they're in the battlefield, they would, you know, and they would fight battles, right? They had a military, they had structure. And then he was so impressed by them, he asked them, well, you know, how do you, what do you guys do? How do you have all this? Right? He said it was very simple. They said, it's, it's quite simple, you know, all you need to do is, you need to have one of these. What is this? He's like, oh, it's an idol. If you have these idols, you know, you just go and you worship the idol and it basically takes your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's all you need to do. So they attributed all this advancement to this. And then, he, and then he's amazed by this. He says, wow. He says, let me get one of them. So they gift him Hubal. Hubal. Does anyone who know who Hubal is? This is the first idol to be brought into the sacred valley of Bekah. This is the first idol to be brought. And remember, if you remember, who mentioned Hubal after one of the battles? Right? It was Abu Sufyan after the battle of Uhud. When the Muslims, it seemed that they were defeated, right? He was shouting Hubal's name, basically to say that our gods are basically better, or Hubal is better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, astaghfirullah, right? But then, Umar responded with the permission of the Prophet Sallallahu telling them that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is our Mawla, right? And you have no Mawla. La Mawla lakum. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is our is our Mawla, and you have nothing. So he responded back, and obviously Abu Sufyan did not like that because he thought that they were all dead. So, Hubal is the first idol to be brought. And this is 500 years before the Prophet ﷺ. This is 500 years before the Prophet 
And during this time, all of these people, who were they worshipping before Hubal? What were they worshipping? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They always worshipped Allah. They always worshipped Allah. The tribe of Quraysh worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why it gets kind of confusing. And don't worry, in today's time it's confusing as well. It gets confusing. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَهُمْ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهُ If you ask some, if you ask any of Quraysh, if you ask them, who created you? What do they say? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. If you ask Abu Jahl, he's going to say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Jahl, right? Abu Jahl. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you ask Safwan ibn Umayyah, he's going to say the same thing. If you ask Umayyah ibn Khalaf, he's going to say the same thing. If you ask Al-Walid, he's going to say the same thing. وَلَئِنْ سَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Wow, let's go even deeper. Deeper than this. <laughs> Who created the heavens and the earth? They say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not say Hubat. They don't say Hubat. They say Allah. So even, even during the time of Prophet 2,500 years after Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam, they still recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In today's time, we can go to Rutgers University right here and we can ask any of the Hufa. <coughs> and by the way, it's not an insult to call If they're Kafir, they're Kafir. They're disbelievers. We're Kafir to them. We're, they're, we're, we're Kafir to them. So anyone who has the, their, to their belief system, we're Kufa. To our belief system, they're Kufa. They're rejecting our, our belief system and we reject their belief system. So it's not that this is, this is so strange that all of a sudden, don't say Kafir. Don't say Kafir. What are you talking about? It's like the word, it's just a word, it's not a curse word. Right? They're, they rejected our way and, and we are kufr, our way for them, they, they, if they knew Arabic, or we could say ancient Arabic, they would call us kafir as well. Right? Disbelievers. We disbelieve in what they believe in. So if you ask them, right, who created the heavens and the earth? Who created the universe? Will they say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, they won't. They will not say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They'll say Big Bang. Big Bang theory. So they're far from even the people of Quraysh. Look how close they are to us. That they say Allah. If you, if you went, maybe even if you asked a Muslim, he might not even say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth. This is how far we've come. Look at this. It's not, don't, don't be amazed by these answers that we get. But I'm amazed by the answers that Quraysh has given. This is what amazes me. Because when, you, you know, when, you, when you're young and they teach you about the tribes, and they teach you about Abu Jahl, they te you, you think that these people are way off. <coughs> and by the way, even Abu Jahl, you know, I know, we, you know you, you ha we hate him. We hate him because of what he did to the Prophet ﷺ. But it's not that clear if you were living in Quraysh at that time. How did he achieve that status? How did he become this man? He was generous. Generous! He would feed the Arabs. And, 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 and Banu Makhzum, who he was the leader of, he, they, they loved him. He would take care of his tribe completely. They, they, they loved him. Generous. And he spoke with wisdom. And he was eloquent. So, don't, you know, everyone's like, oh, this guy is just complete. No. You can easily have been fooled to follow him rather than following the Prophet <coughs> But let's continue and then we'll touch back on this again. So, if you ask them, right, if you ask any of the kuffar, they're going to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَئِنْ سَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ نَزَّلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَحْيَا بِهِ الْأَرْضِ مِنْ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا لِيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ Even deeper, even deeper to affirm their belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you ask them who brought the water from the skies, right? And that water brings life back from this dead earth. Who does that? They say, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again! I mean, you can't get more clear that these people believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what's the point of Hudan? Or Allah, al Uzza? How many idols did they fill up? Because remember, Quraysh brought Amr ibn Luhayl al Khuzai, he's the one that brought the first idol there. Once he brings the first idol, where do the rest of them come from? Then all the Arab tribes, they need to follow suit. They say, oh, if they have a, an idol, then we need to bring our idol. And then other ones need to bring an idol. And we need to store these idols in this sacred place. What's that sacred place? In the Mecca Valley. Right? This is what they want to do. Even they had idols in Safa and Marwa. They had idols on top of Safa and Marwa. So when we, the Muslims, why do we say, you know, Inna Safa wal Marwa min Allah? Why do we say this? When we, does anyone know? Why, why, we say, why we say that when we, that they are from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because the Muslims were hesitant. Listen, the Muslims, after they accepted Islam, and the Muslims, uh, the Muslims were instructed to do, go between Safa and Marwa, they were hesitant to do to go between Safa and Marwa because there were two idols on top of Safa and Marwa, which the Prophet destroyed. But there were two idols, and they always thought that Safa and Marwa were linked to these two idols. And these two idols, does anyone know the story of those two idols? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a man and a woman who had this relationship. Well, I'm not going to mention their names, right? Because there's no point in giving them any recognition, right? A man and a woman. During the times before the Prophet ﷺ, way before, they had a relationship. They couldn't find anywhere to have their relations. So they went inside the Kaaba. And when they did it inside the Kaaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala petrified them, made them stone. Right? And then when Quraysh saw this, they said, Wow, this is amazing. This is like a miracle. Although they, they know that the act was vile. This is what jahiliyyah, this is the jahiliyyah. Ignorance! So they said, let's take them and put one on Safa and one, one on Marwa. So when the Muslims accepted Islam, they thought that this was linked. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Safa wal Marwa ta min illa. No. <laughs> Safa and Marwa existed before they even put these idols here. Because, that's why I linked it back to what I told you. Safa and Marwa came from who? Hajar. Right, we just mentioned this, right? It came from her. She's the one who's running back and forth. She's the one that was going back and forth, right? The one who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one whose affirmation and, and tawheed and tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was firm. Right? So let's continue. So the idols are perpetuating throughout the Bekka Valley from one Hubal to over 360. <coughs> By the time the Prophet came and destroyed all of them. Right? and started destroying this idolatry. <coughs> but, I want to understand one thing. This is, the, this is the point now. Here is the point. This is something that we really need to understand. Did they worship these idols? Did they worship these idols? Did the kuffar of Quraysh worship these idols? Obviously, they sacrificed. Right? They had all these superstitious beliefs. And by the way, this is another satanic Ritual. This is another satanic thing. Allah making you believe in superstitions. Right? This is one of those traps that you start looking for these signs other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Superstitious beliefs. Every third camel, if it's a male, then that means this and that needs to be sacrificed for this. Every, every, every culture has its own superstitious beliefs. Every culture has its own superstitious mm -hmm. beliefs. Right? So in... You know, where we come from, where I come from, in, uh, the Albanian traditions, we have our own superstitious beliefs. So this is not, if it's, a, if it's not from the Quran and Sunnah, we should stay away from it. This is, we do not dictate our lives to these types of superstitions. Right? So, and this is something that was also added to the area, because this is not part of the deen. So did they worship these idols? They looked like they're worshipping them. So, the, the ulama, Right? The ulama of kufr, of idolatry. Listen to what they say. Listen to what they say. As Allah SWT tells us in the Quran, he says very, they say very clearly. The Prophet says, if you say that the heavens and the earth are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you say that you 
I've been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you say that the water which comes from the sky, which are science students today, we go into Rutgers and we ask them, who sends the water? They're going to tell me water cycle. Right? The Muslims will say water cycle when it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who brings everything. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you kuffar are saying that all of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then why are you worshipping these idols? Why are you worshipping Hubal? Why are you worshipping Allah? Why are you worshipping al Uzza? Why are you doing this? And then listen to what they say. مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَى This is amazing. This is amazing. Listen to the... This ayah needs to be memorized. This ayah you need to have really a firm understanding of what this ayah means. They say, the ulama of the kuffar are saying, how can you say we worship them? We don't worship these idols. We don't worship them? We don't worship these idols. Except that they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Except that they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you believe this? So what do we do today? What lessons do we learn from that today? What do we do? From this, we see where the Quraysh have gone wrong. How many thousand years are we now away from the Prophet Sallallahu message? 1,500 approximately. 1,500 years. Do you think that there are Muslims today? Do you think that our own brothers and sisters somewhere in the world that they are worshipping something that brings them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, no, we don't worship it, except that it brings us closer to Allah. Maybe not for you, I'm going to tell you about myself. When you go and visit Albania, there are these special graves. Special. Who knows who's buried there? We have no idea. You ask them, they don't even know. Right? It, could be, it could be an animal that's buried there. Right? Special. Who knows what? People go there and they do rituals. <coughs> rituals. Rituals. They perform <coughs> rituals there. Why? So that this grave will bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So do you worship Allah? Say, of course we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say we worship Allah. Except we bring come here, so this thing will bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I needed to lay down the history. You have to understand where we came from. We have to understand the mistakes that were made in the past. So that 1,500 years later, after the Prophet said, we don't make the same mistakes. We don't want to make the same mistakes. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did the Prophet said? Listen to what the Prophet said. He himself said that he has not left anything to bring you closer to Jannah except that he has ordered you to do it. He said, I have told you of everything that will get you closer to Jannah. Isn't you want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why? Because you want to get to Jannah. If you want to get to Jannah, everything is through the Prophet. He will show you. He has shown us everything and has commanded us of everything that will get us closer to, all, to, to, the, to Jannah. Basically closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And also he continues and he said, I have not left anything that will take you away from the hellfire that I have not stayed, told you to stay away from. Basically prohibited you from it. So there you go. He has told us the things that we should stay away from and the things that we should be doing. Because there's no need. But it's my, it's my great-grandfather that used to go visit there too. My great-grandfather. So, he made a mistake. I make dua for him. Allah forgive him for his, his, his mistakes. But again, who's what? That's why I said, who are my, who, who are my ancestors? Who are they? Who are they? Our pious predecessors. Umar Radhi Abu Bakr, Ali Radhi Anhu, Radhi Allah, Radhi Allah Anhu, all of them. 
These are the people that we emulate. These are the people that we follow. These are the people that the Prophet ﷺ has said they are the best people to come out. These are the people. This is who we should follow. These are our pious predecessors. These are our relatives, if you want to say. So even if my great-grandfather did such a thing, I will not do it. I will not do it. Because it isn't something that our pious predecessors have done. It isn't something that they have done. Very simple historic lessons. Now the question is, will we put them into practice? How much time do we have? Because I wanted to leave some time for question and answer in case anyone had any questions or answers. Let's continue. Because I remember I want to take you back. I want to take you back to what we mentioned before. I'm going to take you to me, Miqdad ibn al Asad. Right? He is one of the Sahabis of the Prophet. Again, one of our beloved. One of our beloved. Right? Someone that accepted Islam early. Right? And he fought in the battles with the Prophet. So the Prophet had passed away. And Miqdad was sitting while one of the Tabi'is, another one of the men had walked by and saw Mirdad and obviously they know who Mirdad is, obviously, because you know, he's a Sahabi, he's someone that had fought in the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had fought with the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he said to him, he said to him, you know, that he had wished that he had his eyes that he has witnessed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he had been during that time with him, with Mithdad, that he had, would have experienced what he had experienced. Right? Sounds like khair? Sounds like something good? Sounds. But Mithdad gets upset. He gets upset at this. Right? And then he, he replies to him. He says, why would you wish for something that when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala has allowed you to recognize his Lord, to recognize Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's Lord, right? that you know that Allah is your Lord and that is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not decree for you why would you wish for something? he said there were many that had seen the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with their eyes right? there were many that had seen the Prophet with their eyes and rejected him why would you want such a test? rather rather and who is he talking about? he said even he said he goes deeper he says when the message came forth, there would be fathers and their sons would reject. And there would be relatives that their sons, their fathers would reject. Brothers and brothers that they would, one would reject and one would accept. What kind of fitna is this? The bloodlines, right? The bloodlines are being broken here. One would accept the Prophet the other one would not. One would accept the message, the other one would not. So what were they doing? What would they say? What, would, what, would the, what were the Muslims saying at this time when this was happening? They would say, رَبَّنَا هَبَلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْمٍ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَاهَا This is the tafsir of this ayah. Go to kitab, you'll find it in Kathir. And this hadith is from Muslim Ahmed. Right? This is it. ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما. They were saying it. These are the عباد الرحمن. These were the our pious predecessors that have accepted Islam, knowing that their father might go to hellfire, knowing that their son might go to hellfire, knowing that their mother, their brothers, that they would go, their own children might go to hellfire. They turned to who? To Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما. This is the see? This is what they would say. So this is what we're talking about. This is what we are today. This is from the dua of our pious predecessors. And wallahi, I will not betray that dua. I will not betray that dua. This is the key thing. That we will be qurrat ayun, meaning that, and Ibn Abbas makes it clear, what does that mean to be qurrat ayun for your, for your, for, for your families is that you are upon this deen this Quran and 
husband of ours, which is so strange. You know, sometimes us here, we, you know, we get comfortable. We, we, th we think that we're, we are the only Muslims that exist. We have our beards, right? We have our thawbs. We come to the masjid. <laughs> we're always thinking about coming to the masjid. Brothers, you, our own brothers and sisters. Here in Piscataway, and in, in the United States, wherever you want to say, our own brothers and sisters. And they are our brothers and sisters in Islam. They are our own brothers and sisters in Islam. They, they're not coming. And we, we have to still remember them. And we need to pray for them. And we want them to come here. Let us not be so... Let, in our appearance, and not just our appearance, in our way of dealing with them, that we become so distant, so strange, so weird, <coughs> that they cannot relate to us in any way. Because remember, they are our brothers and sisters. We need to make this environment in a way that we can bring them back to this way of ours. That they, that's why what, what, at the end, what is it? رَبَّنَا هَبِ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَاتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيْنَ وَجَعَلُ اللَّهِ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا That we would be the imam, meaning what? That we would be the, an example for others to follow. And that would be with our mannerisms. That we would bring, show them the beauty of Islam. Show them the izzah of Islam. Right? Show them the izzah. Because remember, to be honored, this honor that everyone is looking for, right? Everyone wants to be honored. They want to have this status. That status only comes from Al Mu'izz, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That status only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something we need to understand. We are nothing without this deen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us honor and honored us with this deen and Islam. And nothing should ever surpass that. Nothing. This, this should be firm in our hearts. So, yes, brothers, one of the things, just, just a, something to think about, something to think about. So what are those things? Because sometimes we might fall into those things. So uh, let's go back to our thing. I'm not going to, uh, each culture has its own thing, so I'm going to go back to my culture. Right? So us, we have these blue eyes. Right? Blue, right? These blue eyes. And, you know, they always give them as gifts to people. Right, you know, you, you buy a house, they'll give you this blue eye. You take the blue eye and hang it somewhere, it's going to protect your house. You buy a car, the blue eye, they give you, protects your car. If, you, if you're traveling somewhere, the blue eye, and they take it with you to protect you. But where did it come from? What is this blue eye? I know for you, from the subcontinent, you're like, blue eye? I don't know what you're talking about. You must see it when you travel. If you travel somewhere in, in Arabia, if you go to like Turkey and stuff, you'll see it, right? This blue eye. So it's with us too. We have this blue eye. Has anyone, everyone seen that before? Yeah, blue eye. You've seen it, right? Yeah. So this is something that comes from Turkinism, which is the religion of the original Mongols. Right? They thought that Allah, and by the way, Mongolia is flat lands, flat. They are you know, not mount mountainous, like uh, Albania is completely mountainous, right? All mountains everywhere, mountains, mountains. But Mongolia, <coughs> flat. And the sky, the beautiful blue sky, it's beautiful, blue, right? So they knew that Allah was somewhere in the skies, right? So they said, they looked and they said, oh, well, we want to bring Allah with us. So in Turkmenism, they would make the eye, basically Allah watching over you and the blue sky behind it. So this existed before Islam. This is something that the Mongols would do. So when they accepted Islam, right, and who do we, when, and Islamically when we talk about Mongols, we talk about all of the, that whole region, right? We're talking about the, all of the, the tribes that come from Dagestan, Uzbekistan, going back all the way down to the Turks, right? All the way down, right? So they originally worshipping Turganism. So then they blew up. And they would do it. And then when they accept Islam, what do they do? They put Masha Allah on the eye. Or Allahu Akbar on the eye. And then they say, now we've Islamicized it. So now you can use it. So this is something that we, it's completely wrong. 
So we, we're not, we shouldn't do this. You shouldn't be using these du'as. Again, why? Because then you're saying that this thing is giving you something from that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. There's no need to have these amulets, whether it be these blue eyes, or whether it be the hand of Fatima, right? That's coming from Iraq, right? The hand of Fatima. Five, it comes like this. You go, if you go to Jordan, for instance, you know, I go, I go to the meat market, right? If you're trying to make a famous dish called mensa, it's trying to get some fresh lamb, so we go to the meat market, going from store to store. Each one has either the blue eye or plus the hand. Hand of Fatima, right? The hand of Fatima, basically. They call it the hand of Fatima, but it's, it goes back to Zoroastrian traditions. This is the hand of God, basically, that's protecting you. But they don't know. And in, in the middle of hand of Fatima, says Allah, or, or MashaAllah, keep going, keep going, keep going. Finally, no store has any of these things. So I say, oh, brother, <laughs> I said, do you have this type of you on shoulder meat? Shoulder lamb meat is the best meat for mensa, right? So you say, brother, do you have the shoulder lamb meat? He said, yes. He says, you know, I, when I, I look around, I say, I didn't see anything. So I said, you know, I talked to my, uh, my uh, uh, the person that's with me, I asked him. I said, he said, are you going to ask him about the blue eye? He said, I'm not going to ask him. What if it's hiding behind it? We're going to have no meat. <laughs> no, but I asked him afterwards. I asked him, I said, he's like, no, no, no. He said, we don't believe in that. We don't believe in that, those superstitions, right? So these are the things you have to be careful. And today's time, by the way, your youth, they're coming up with other things. They have these bracelets that have this Chinese writing. This Chinese writing will affect your chi. You put it here. When I shoot the basketball, I shoot better with the, the bracelet. But when I don't have the bracelet, it doesn't go in. Right? And this is this funny. It's funny. But it goes, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى right? He's telling you, even when you throw, you did not throw except that Allah threw. So any questions? Because that's it, time is up. Any questions? Everyone understands everything. <laughs> I'm up, man. So basically my question is, um, you mentioned Ed Wujan, and, uh, and he was like the leader, the general of, at that time, in um, Ben Abashim and, and Becca, right? So basically my question... Not Ben Abashim, Ben Marzum, but yeah. Quraysh. So basically my question is, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about Abu Jahl, but Abu Lahab, for example, he was the Prophet's like uncle, right? Yeah, so, my, so my question is like, how could he have so much enmity like towards the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he's his own uncle, and at that time they were like very high ranks, like Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl. So if you could like elaborate on that. That's shaitan. Hmm. That's, that's one of the traps of shaitan. The shaitan will come and tell you so many things. Like for instance, if, if the Pro he didn't accept the Prophet sallallahu alaihi because of status, right? Because they would diminish his status from Ben Hash. That's one. Of, that's why uh, you know. But at the end of the day, it's all shaitan. Shaitan will whisper to you so many things. Right? So the thing is that you know, the Abd of Rahman. What does he do? He is humble. وَيَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَ وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا. Right? They are humble when they walk on the. Earth, they don't walk in this haughty pasture, like in this. They don't walk in this way where they look, look at me, type of thing. What, what do they do? They walk humbly and they present themselves humbly, right? And when the jahil comes, the jahil is one who who is ignorant and doesn't doesn't want to hear any advice or anything. He says, "Salam, you leave me alone, right?" Salam. So no, it's it's all shaitan. And. And many of you might have thought that we were going to talk about jinn and shaitan. We're going to continue talking about jinn and shaitan. Because I'm going to keep bringing the supernatural into it. Because many, it's separated. People, you know, don't recognize the dangers of the, the shayateen in our time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. In these days, in our culture, a lot of people, a lot of places do maulid, milat, uh, opening house, new business. Somebody died or something, any fortunate thing, they have been like, how, how would you do the same thing? No, yeah, they do it in the, our culture as well. They call it milad, right? And so that milad they would attribute to everything, everything. Even the person dies. Yes. The person has died and they're doing milad, right? And they're reciting these verses about this and when the person has passed away. It doesn't make sense. It really has no basis in our tradition, right? Again, because remember, they say, well, your great-grandfather did it. They tell me, my great-grandfather did it. They say, okay, you know, he did it, but my great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather's 
We're talking about the Sahaba, the Tabi'in, the Tabi'in, the Tabi'in, the Prophet. None of them did it, so I'm not going to do it, right? But, you know, it's, it, that is something that, you know, we have to have this firm belief. That's why, by the way, I gave you historically, because we want to stay as far away from these things as possible, because we do not want to fall into the same trap that happened to Quraysh. And Quraysh were descendants of prophets, right? They're descendants of prophets. So that's why we have this strong aversion. That's why we are very careful of how to do these things. Right? So we, that's why it's better to be careful and stay away from these types of things, especially when it comes to these aspects of the deen, than just to take any ritual and anything and follow along. Because when, when uh, Amr ibn al Khuzai brought Hubal, the Quraysh followed him. Although he's not from Quraysh, they followed him. Right? So they accepted it and they, they, they went through with it. So that's the problem. So we're not someone that just follow blindly. Inshallah. Any other questions? Yes? Asib. Uh, I want to go back to what Yadah talked about when we take him on the Qadr Salaam. That when we approach the people of Jaidiyah, we say Salaam. We say Salaam. So there are people um, nowadays that... By the way, Muslim can be Jahid too, by the way. Yeah. I just say, it's not that. Not just the, the Kuffar. So there are people that... Um, have this idea that we, they like make that their personality, that we are above the, the jahil, that, like, that they express that openly sometimes like through videos, sometimes like confront, confronting them in person. I mean, by virtue, we are better than but do, the you, What about the first part of the ayah? What are you talking about? Yeah, no, I'm showing, I'm showing on the hawna. Yeah, could you explain that? Yeah, he's humble. He doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, we're better than you. <laughs> you know, you need to know who we are. So, you need to listen to me. I'm the man. You nobody. No, it's not, that's not, that's not Abdul Rahman. He walks on the earth humbly. Humble, right? When he approaches you, he's humble, right? He's humble, right? And he, and then the jahid doesn't want to listen to the truth. That's why the jahid says salam. He approaches the person that he sees that, oh, this person is willing to listen. Let me tell him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me tell him about our way. Don't waste your time with someone that is just going to argue with you about it. If you try, that's it. Say, oh, you know, lakum dinukum wa okay. So you have your, your, your way and we have our way. If you, whenever you're ready to listen, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to tell you. So that's not our, our, our way is to teach the people that are willing to listen. The ones that want to. To, to say. By the way, even for the Muslims, even for the Muslims, you know, there are some Muslims that they use foul language. Right? They use foul language. You know, they, you know, and even if they're saying it to themselves, right? They're like, F this, F that. F leave me alone. F, 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 F. It's like, that's not our way. We don't do that. Muslims do not behave this way. Because the Prophet said, this is not one of us who, who behaves in this manner. Right? Who does this type of thing. Right? So even this, this is not so whoever, you know, has accepted Islam, or even for myself, this is just a reminder that you shouldn't be using foul language if you're representing Islam. You shouldn't be using foul language. It's nothing to do with Hasid, but I'm just saying in general, as a reminder for myself, right? Muslims do not use this type of language, right? But, so, yeah, it's, it, you know, you speak to people humbly. If they accept the message, they accept it. If they don't, they don't, right? It's, your job is very simple. You have to find those people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they're looking for the truth. They're going to engage you. They're going to want to talk to you. Then the other ones who just want to argue, you say, Assalamu alaikum. Let them do the Anyone else? Okay, Jazakum Allah khair. Anyway, if any questions, we can talk about it over breakfast, inshaAllah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah, ashadu an la ilayla, astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayla.